going to look a bit more detail of uh, this idea of locus and complex numbers. Circles mentioned that the other day. But let's just recap. There's our standard circle, center at the origin, radius r. And we saw we could write this now as z times z conjugate equals r squared. But we have an even better way of writing it, because now we've talked about modulus. The other thing all these complex numbers have in common is that their distance to the origin is the same. In other words, the radius. So the modulus will be the radius of the circle. So you see mod z equals a constant number, you know that that represents a circle. Of course, if you were to shift it, then we saw z minus omega, z conjugate minus omega conjugate would be radius squared. But now we could write it as, well, the length of the vector joining any of these z's to w would be the radius of the circle. So again, modulus equals constant. We know we've got this circle. Be very, very careful though, because the modulus is the radius, not the radius squared like we're used to seeing in circles. It's the radius. Okay, so let's, uh, well, let's find expressions for these circles. X squared plus Y squared equals 16. Well, that's what we're used to seeing in Cartesian form. That would become, well, modulus of Z is equal to 4. Of course, I could have said Z times Z conjugate is 16. That would have been another way of doing it. Hmm, this one I've got a bit of work to do. I'm going to have to complete the square on both the X's and the Y's. So half the coefficient of X, half of 6 is 3. Half of Y is negative 2, uh, which means our constant becomes 25. Uh, it's still z minus the center. The center in this one would be uh, negative 3, positive 2i, but because it's minus, it basically matches what's in the parentheses there. So plus 3, minus 2i, because remember it's minus the center. And the radius for this one would be 5. In the conjugate form, it would look like that. So z plus 3 minus 2i, conjugate of z plus 3 plus 2i, 25. Let's go back the other way. What's the centre and the radius of? Modulus of z minus 5 minus i is 2. Okay, z minus the centre. So the centre would be 5, 1, and the radius is 2. I suppose you could say the centre is uh, the point 5 plus i if you wanted to write it that way. Mm, this one's in conjugate form. So I'm going to look at the first parentheses. I think it's easier to look at the z plus 4 plus i to work out the centre rather than the conjugate one. So it's z minus the centre. So the centre is minus 4 minus 1. And the radius of this one would be 7. Modulus of 3z is equal to the modulus of z plus 2 minus i. So it's not one of those standard ones. When you look at this one straight away, not immediately obvious what it is. So in that case, let's bring it back to Cartesian geometry and see if we can come up with an equation. I'll factorise the 3 outside of the magnitude, absolute value, modulus, call it whatever you like. So 3 times the modulus of z. Remember, modulus of z is square root of x squared plus y squared. So you'll notice what I've done is I've also squared it at the same time. So on the left-hand side, I've got 9x squared plus 9y squared. On the right-hand side, really, it's just the distance formula. So it'd be x plus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared. Expanding that all out, collecting the terms, we can see, yeah, we're going to end up with a circle because the coefficient of x squared and y squared is the same. So we know it has to be a circle. Let's make it look like one. I prefer to have 1x squared and 1y squared when I complete the square. So I'll divide everything by 8. Now I want half the coefficients, sort out my constant. Not the prettiest looking equation, but it is what it is. So the center is a quarter minus one eighth, and the radius, three root five on eight. Hmm, here's another one where it's not immediately obvious what we got. So z times z conjugate plus twice z plus z conjugate. Well, z plus z conjugate, that's our x squared plus y squared. Uh, z plus z conjugate, so the imaginary parts would disappear, we'd have twice the real part. So we'll end up with x squared plus y squared plus 4x is equal to 0. Another circle. Complete the square, and there we have it. The centre is at negative 2, 0, and the radius would be 2. Okay, so that was circles. Lines. Now we talked about the horizontal line. 
where they've all got the imaginary part being the same, and the vertical line where they've got all the real part the same. But that's a really uh, narrow selection of lines. Obviously, there's lots of other ones. So what happens when they're at an angle? So something like that. One of the ways of writing is thinking of it as a perpendicular bisector. You should be able to find two points that it will be the perpendicular bisector of. So that being the case, if it is a perpendicular bisector, then every point on this line would be the same distance to W1 than it is to W2. So the length of those vectors would be equal. All right. Now you might be thinking, well, how would you know these two points? And the reality is you probably wouldn't. But this is how we create what it looks like, is that idea. Because the process is probably the other way around. We see modulus equals modulus, and then we go, ah, right, that's a straight line. It's going to be the perpendicular bisector of these two points that they've given me. Let's try this one then. See, modulus equals modulus. By the way, it's got to be a linear function for it to work. I mean, if that was modulus of z squared, it's not going to work. But modulus equals modulus. Okay, I could go the long way about it if I forgot about perpendicular bisector and break it into Cartesian. So x minus 1 squared, etc., etc. Expand out, group the like terms, and we get our general equation. I suppose it's not that much work if you did want to do it that way. So 6x plus 4y plus 3 equals 0. But the other way of doing it is saying, well, hang on, I know it's going to be the perpendicular bisector of 1, 1, and negative 2, negative 1. So it must pass through the midpoint if it's the perpendicular bisector. So the midpoint is minus a half zero. And I can work out the slope. It's two thirds. So it's perpendicular to that. Therefore, the slope I want is minus three on two. Point slope formula. And we end up with the equation. Now, you might be looking at it and think, well, hang on. Surely that's more work. Possibly it was for this particular one. It all depends on the numbers and how the question is actually words it. Because if you get something like this, sketch. Now, nowhere did it say find the equation or anything like that. It simply said sketch. So it's going to be quicker to simply sketch. I know it's the perpendicular bisector of negative 2 and 4. Well, hang on. They're immediately above each other. If it's a perpendicular bisector, we must be talking about a horizontal line that goes halfway between these two points. So it'll go through one, there it is. And that's a lot quicker than trying to find the equation using the formula and what have you. So it really depends on the, the question. Rays. Oh, now you've got to send your mind back. Ray? What's a ray again? Remember this. Lines, rays, and intervals. A line, so that's a line over there. A line is something that extends out to infinity in both directions. An interval has a definite starting and finishing point, and a ray is the mixture of the two. So it has a definite starting point, but then goes off to infinity. So a ray would look something like that. What do they have in common? Well, every point on that ray has the same argument. See, if it was to keep going with the line, it wouldn't have the same argument. Because as soon as it goes below the x-axis here, remember it's the, always the angle to the x-axis. So it would be different. So you see argument of something is equal to an angle, then you know we're talking about a ray. Notice the starting point has an open circle because the starting point of a ray is never included because you don't know its argument. Because you don't know which direction it's going until it starts going. But we could also shift that. Say we started at a different point. Well, then it's just the argument of the vector that's joined up to omega. So z minus omega is equal to theta. So just the same shifting idea. This allows us now to draw regions in the plane, things like that. So we want that the modulus of z is less than 1. And the argument of z is in between 0 and pi and 4. We want all the possible numbers that will do this. Okay. Well, mod z less than 1, we know that's a circle... Center at the origin, radius 1. And it's dotted because it's just less than. So there's mod z equals 1, the, is the boundary. Are we inside or outside? We've got to be inside, don't we? Yeah, less than. So we're inside. Okay. Now for our argument. 
Well, that would be the ray that represents the argument of z is equal to pi on 4. So it's gone off at 45 degrees. And, of course, the one being 0 just goes out horizontally. And we're between those two uh, vectors, rays, whatever you want to call them. Therefore, we must be in that little sector there. That's the sector we're interested in. But there's something else I should do here. Because it's still like a region of the plane coordinate geometry. I've got a dotted line, meaning a solid line. So I really should circle those points of intersection. Because the point of intersection would not satisfy both of these. It would only satisfy one of them. Well, now again, diagram. Sketch this one. So what we got? Uh, well, it's a circle. Modulus equals a constant number. So the center is at minus 2, 2. Now, when you do these, don't get lazy. Think about it sensibly. If that center is at minus 2, 2, and the radius is 2, then it must just touch the axes. Right? So you don't want to see a diagram where the circle overlaps the axis, because right? that would be wrong. Find the possible values of the argument of z. So z could be any number on that red circle. So what are all the possible values for the arguments? So how do we do this? It's joined up to the origin because it's argument of z. So if I draw tangents from the origin to our circle, that must give us the two extremes for the argument. Because it'd be the furthest around you could go and the closest you could go when you're returning. Now, conveniently, in our diagram, they're already there because it's the axes themselves. Therefore, I know that the argument of z for these ones must go in between pi on 2 and pi. What about the modulus then? If we have to find the minimum and the maximum values of the modulus of z. Okay. Well, again, it's joined up to the origin because we're saying distance to the origin. The closest point must be down here and the furthest here. You join the centre of the circle to the reference point you're talking about. In this case, it's the origin. And then that line, if you continue it through the circle, the two points of intersection should give you the minimum modulus and the maximum modulus. So the black one I've drawn in there is the minimum. The blue one is the maximum. So we just have to find that length. Well, we know the radius of the circle. We just need to know this little bit in here. Okay, distance to the centre would be 2 root 2. Yeah, we could work that out. A bit of Pythagoras would get that. We know the radius of the circle is 2. Therefore, the minimum one must be 2 root 2 minus 2. And the maximum must be 2 root 2 plus 2. So to do that, you always join the centre to the reference point. Now, my example, I've conveniently got the reference point as the origin. There's no reason why they couldn't have said, find the um, maximum value of mod, oh, I know, z plus 3, for instance. Well, then you join it up to 3 and do the same idea, try and find that distance. So let's uh, finish off with this one. Last year's HSC question, quite possibly the most difficult region in the plane question they've ever had. Okay. We're going to sketch the region of the complex plane defined by the real part of Z is always greater than or equal to the argument of Z. Argument of Z is the principal argument of Z. So in other words, it's got to be in between pi and minus pi. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Don't know. You look at it originally, you go, I'm not sure. So let's take it back to Cartesian, try and work out what the boundary is. So the boundary curve. X is equal to the inverse tan Y on X. That's what it's saying, because the real part of Z would be X. The argument of Z would be the inverse tan of Y on X. So we'll undo that. We'll take the tan of both sides, make Y the subject. So the boundary curve is Y equals X tan X. That brought up the first problem. Well, what on earth does that look like? Well, I'm multiplying Y equals X, so my blue straight line there, with y equals tan x, so the red curves there. I'm multiplying those two things together. x is an odd function, tan x is an odd function, so I know my answer should be even. Okay, so that's the first thing I know. I know I'm going to be in that section there, because positive times a positive is a positive. It'll also be positive there, because we just said it's an even function. What about the other side of the asymptote? Well, I'm going to have negative times positive over there, so that's negative, but that means I'm negative over here. 
as well. Why did I stop there? Because remember, I'm only really interested in the principal argument here. That's what the curve ends up looking like. Once you start bending towards the asymptote, you can test a few points to make sure, but you end up with this shape. Okay, that's the boundary curve. Now we've got to work out the regions that we're in. So let's test the regions. Over in quadrant one, okay, you've got all these sections that we need to check. The argument of Z is always in between zero and pi on two in the first quadrant. So let's pick a point. I'm picking it on the asymptote. Just to highlight to you, that point is included because it's not on the boundary, so that's fine. But it will be included because it is possible to substitute that into the original inequality and get an answer. And if we do sub it in, uh, we see it equals pi on 2 plus 1. Well, pi on 2 is going to be greater than or equal to the argument of pi on 2 plus 1. <coughs> Has to be, because we're in the first quadrant. So the argument of that point must be less than pi on 2. Yep. So I'm on the right-hand side of that curve. Let's have a look at quadrant 2. What happens down here? Quadrant 2. Argument of z is always in between 90 and 180, or pi and 2 and pi. Well, all points over here have a real value that's less than 0, because right? all the x's are negative. So therefore, every point over there doesn't work. So nothing in that quadrant. Nothing at all. Quadrant 3. This time we're in between minus pi and minus pi on 2. I'll test a point. So I'll use minus pi on 2 and minus 1. Now, minus pi on 2 and minus i, well, minus pi on 2 is always bigger. So therefore, I'm in that section there. That just leaves me with quadrant 4. Well, quadrant 4, the argument's in between 0 and minus pi on 2. But every point here has a real value of zero. Therefore, every point will satisfy the inequality. Now, I have shaded past pi on here just to point out that even though what I was considering there, I only dealt between minus pi and pi because of the principal argument. These other points to the right-hand side are still included because they will satisfy the inequality when you sub it in. That is the solution. But there's a couple of other things to point out about the solution. You might have noticed I've added in. Argument of zero is undefined. You can't find the argument of zero. I need to circle it. So zero, zero is not included in the solution. The whole interval from zero, zero to minus pi zero is also not included. Because at those points, argument of z is defined to be pi at those points. Again, go back to the original inequality, what will we solve? It doesn't satisfy it. The region, and that's what I was just talking about, it does not end at x equals pi, as it's the argument that goes in between minus pi and pi, not z. Z can go further. Average was, anyone remember what, 0 0.5? There you go. That was a three mark question. Or was it a four mark question? No, a three mark question. Oh yeah, sure, some people got it. But I'm ending. <laughs>